Hi, Joe Alcoholic. <clears throat> hmm. I'd like to go back to those two basic ones in agreement and one's a decision. One's on page 73. I'm sorry, page 76. At the bottom of the next to the last paragraph in the middle of the eighth step, it says, remember, it was agreed at the beginning that we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. And on page 58, in the middle of the second paragraph, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. It's also interesting that at another point in that, uh, how it works, they say, remember, we're dealing with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. And from what I've discovered in that book, there's only two places that ask me to remember which assumes two things, that it's something I need to remember and that I'll forget. And that both of those places where they ask me to remember, not that they don't make other strong statements throughout this book, but at both of those places they ask me to remember, they're both about alcohol. I met a man one time and he had had uh, 17 years of sobriety and he said that uh, at 17 years of sobriety, he thought he no longer had an alcohol problem, but a living problem. And he pursued what to do for his living problems. And one day figured that a little alcohol might hap, hap, uh, help him with his living problems and almost died before he got back to this program and had a hard time getting back. And I think even though at the 10th step they make a great promise, which is one of the promises that I don't hear talked about, when they only mention 12 in the uh, ninth step on page 83 that we hear so often, one of the great promises in the, in the tenth step is that we will no longer be fighting alcohol. We'll be, placed, we'll be placed in a position of neutrality. The problem will be removed. Doesn't mean the truth about it is removed. And I think if there was one thing where I get confused on this path, continuing to do this work on a regular basis is between experiencing a time in this work and large periods of time in my life where I, there is no problem and alcohol is not on my back and my ego convincing me then the truth about me and alcohol is no longer true because the problem has been removed. And they asked me to remember not only that I agreed at the beginning what I would do for victory over this stuff but that I would go to any length and to remind me that I am dealing with alcohol. Even though I can be placed in a position of neutrality, the truth about it is still true. That without a spiritual connection on a daily basis, which must be maintained, I only have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of that spiritual condition. So going back to those two statements, which we turn into questions, have I agreed here at the beginning which is where I am when I'm in step one. That doesn't mean just when I was new. I have a sponsor with 26 years who's been doing this work on a yearly basis for 26 years since he was confined in the Colorado State Penitentiary that you'll hear on Sunday morning. And I also have a spiritual advisor who's a female um, who's 33 years sober and has been doing this work, submitting herself to this process every year for 33 years. She just celebrated her 33rd birthday, that that should be as relevant to at 33 years, if not even more, because I'm more awake than it was to me the first time. So these steps, these steps should, no matter how long you're sober, and it's been true from my experience, no matter how long I'm sober, these steps should come to where I am. They should meet me where I am. And these statements and these considerations should be as pertinent and as considerable and as intensifying as they were the first time, if not more. I mean, it seems to me each time through these steps, the proposition, for example, that God is everything or nothing has certainly means a little bit more at ten years than it did at five and a half months. Or 
To die an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis, these two alternatives not being easy to face, should be as relevant to me this time as they were the first time, if not more. And they were more relevant because here's why. The stakes are higher. What did I have to lose ten years ago? Death didn't scare me. I'm not one of these guys that you tried to scare with to drink is to die. My God, that might be my only relief. From where I had been and the things I had had to deal with on a daily basis, from the Michigan State Penitentiary on for 11 more years, I dealt with life and death on a daily basis and there were long periods of time where that might be my only way out. And you didn't scare me with to drink is to die. But when my sponsor shifted a little bit, it caught me. Because you know what he said? You might live a lot longer feeling the way you're feeling, unable to die. That's relevant to where I was then. But now, to die an alcoholic death, I don't want to die because there's some great stuff in my life. The pot's bigger. The bet's higher. So those statements should come. I, I, I think there's nothing sadder than meeting somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous as I have met and then be in a place where I have been at certain times where you literally think, I've done those steps. There's, no for, there's nothing more for me in those steps. I've done them. I've done them once. I've done them 20 times. I've done them five times. I've done them 32 times. Whatever the proposition might be. And to think, there's no more for me in that process. I can't go back to these steps. Now I need to do... And we get to all this other stuff, right? I was um, celebrating my ninth birthday a year ago. And a friend of mine from Denver called me. This was a great day for me. And this guy and I got sober together. I used to work for him when I worked in adolescent treatment, uh, sober. I no longer work in the treatment field. Um, I have my own business and I do investments. And... Um, he called me and he said, Joe, I woke up today and it's my ninth AA birthday. And because of a series of decisions that I have made and a lie that I have believed, I have placed myself away from everybody in AA and I had no one in Denver to call today in AA. And it wasn't that he had gone to that place thinking that working in the field meant he was doing AA and he didn't need to do AA because he's working in the field helping others and doing that is doing AA. It wasn't that he had gone this far away from me. It was that he had made those decisions asleep to that he was making them. And I thought to myself, I would hate to wake up one day and realize through a series of decisions that I've made totally asleep that I'm making them, I've placed myself where there is nobody anymore. And then I realized, think about every inventory you've ever written and look at the times you have made decisions asleep that you were making them and placed yourself in positions where you were separate from everyone. In a... And then I saw I was just like him, that I could do that. So, at seven and a half years, I'm writing inventory again. And I, I don't even know what I was writing about. I don't think what I was writing about had anything to do with what I saw, which is one of the great things about inventory sometimes. I was writing about something and out popped this awareness. Joe, you're experiencing a form of denial stronger than the denial you came here with. Now, that kind of denial we hear talked about a lot. You know, to, den to, de to deny the disease of alcoholism. The only disease that tells you you don't have one. All the stuff, you go to treatment or you come to AA, if you're luckier, and you hear all this stuff about the denial of the disease. We talk about that kind of denial a lot. At seven and a half years, I got in touch with a form of denial stronger than that because now I'm seven and a half years away from my last drink and it's there. And it's a form of denial that I don't hear talked about a lot. And I don't think I'm any more different or any special, any more special or any better than any alky in this room. And I've talked to other friends that have had it too, so I know that it's there. And I've found it within myself and it was there before seven and a half years and it'll probably be there again. And it comes out real subtle sometimes. I don't know if they do it out here, but in Southern California, they do birthday cakes and it's a big thing, right? And you'll get up to take a cake, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. And someone in the back of the room will say, how did you do it? And it's real subtle. Sometimes it's not so subtle. Sometimes it's me 
taking the credit for what I've been giving, and now this is something that I deserve and I've earned, and I'm in the denial of the grace of God. It's no longer a free, undeserved, unearned gift, which is what grace is. It's now something I have earned. And I start to, words, words start to filter into my vocabulary like I have rights now that I'm, and I deserve now that I'm. I mean, here's the paradox for me. I had to do a lot of work in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to find out it's none of the work I've done in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it took a know-it-all like me to do a lot of work to find out that it was none of that. Now, that doesn't mean that wasn't important. That doesn't mean that that wasn't one of the things. That means that at various times in these, in these ten years, I have worshipped every finger that points to God that there is in our program. And by that I mean this. When you're new, you come in and you hear 90 meetings in 90 days. Well, you hear, go to meetings, read the book, get a sponsor, work the steps, be of service. And at various times in my sobriety, I think, you know, the thing in the Sistine Chapel, the finger that points to God and they say in the church, don't worship the church, worship what it points toward. Well, at various times in my sobriety, I have worshipped the fingers of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have worshipped a sponsor. He now lives about a thousand miles from me. Does he keep me sober? Are there times when he's not there? I've worshipped groups. Do they really keep me sober? Or have I met people just like me that have walked out of a group, out of a meeting, with 10,000 phone numbers in their wallet, fresh out of a meeting, made a phone call, did everything they could, and drank? So here I am, I'm new, and I'm going to 90 meetings. I do more than 90 meetings in 90 days because I'm an alcoholic. If one a day is good, three is better, right? <laughs> I did all these meetings, reading the book, I thought I had a sponsor, thought I was working the steps. And during those 90 days, I saw people that were reading the book more. You know, those guys that can recite how it works, but they have no connection to what anything they're saying means, right? I knew guys that spent more time with their sponsor than me. I met guys that went to more meetings than me. I met guys that worked these steps and forgot a few simple things like they weren't the ones doing it. I watched them drink again. And I went to my sponsor and I said, I thought you told me that going to meetings, reading the book, working the steps, getting the sponsor and being of service were what were going to keep me sober. He said, no, dummy, we were just in hopes that going to meetings, reading the book, working the steps, getting a sponsor and being of service would get you in touch with a power that will keep you sober. And I started to look at what these things point toward and focus on that rather than worshiping the finger that was pointing. Because I think this book, these steps, a good sponsor, a good group, a good meeting and being of service is to find and seek and serve God. And I lost my attachment to the fingers. Bill wrote a lot about breaking the unhealthy dependencies in AA. Now, some people have to leave AA to do that. The people I know have been able to get free of the superstition and strange fixed ideas in AA. In AA. Um, I remember getting a crazy idea one day. I was only about a year and a half sober, and I was close to my sponsor. He was right down the street, and I was at the group every week. And I woke up one day, and my head told me, or maybe it wasn't. It said, Joe, you need to go somewhere where there's no AA by yourself, no return ticket, no one in AA, with no Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went, at the, before I saw my sponsor, I shared this at a noon meeting, and there was half the room that said, that's stinking thinking. You're setting yourself up to drink. I told my sponsor, he said, great idea, you might really find something out. Because I'd been doing a lot of traveling. And I always went with somebody in the program. I always called the program. I loved going to meetings out of state. And I always had a return plan and reservations and hotels and everything. He said, check it out. He said, you've done what's necessary to recover. God either is or he isn't. And I went to Mexico, three and a half weeks, on the beach, no AA, by myself, with no plan of when to return home, and realized something. Six weeks later, I'm in Montreal. 55,000 alcoholics. And I'm in one of the, they do an opening meeting in the, in the uh, 
in the Olympic Stadium and a closing meeting in the Olympic Stadium. And all during the rest of the week, it's all these about 10 different, like 10 state conventions in 10 different hotels. And I'm walking through a hotel one day and I see a room like this and a sign outside with the name of the meeting that said Loners Internationalists of AA. And I thought, what? What in the world are loners and internationalists? And I went in the meeting. I heard about five or ten speakers talk about staying sober and what AA meant to them in places where they don't have the luxury of the things that I think are keeping me sober. A man in the Himalayas gets to come down once every five months to an AA meeting. A forest ranger up in the mountains somewhere, seven years. A guy in Alaska, 11 years, him in a big book. And they talked about this program meaning to them a personal relationship with a power greater than themselves. Another time, I was living in Los Angeles, so it was in the last six years, I went to Jamaica. One group, two meetings a week, and they're discussing the first tradition. The group, the common welfare of the group comes first, personal recovery follows close behind. Unity depends on that. And I was going to enlighten them on what we in the West do. And I, and I, for some reason, shut up. And I listened to this man who started the group. And he said, you know, we don't just bring newcomers to our group right away until we find out they're serious or not. And I thought, my God, where I come from, we have 2,000 meetings a week. And we get the new man and we bring him to our group. And I didn't say that. And I listened to the man. And he said, you know, there used to be a man in Montego Bay who was always in and out of our group. And we'd take him in and we'd bring him back to the group and we'd try to heal him and he'd drink again. In and out, in and out, in and out. And one time he went out and he went all over Montego Bay telling people that we use voodoo medicine, mind control, voodoo stuff. And it almost destroyed our group. And we learned to spend time with new people and find out if they're serious before we bring them to the group that's more important than even they are. Not that they weren't spending time with them. They were spending time with them. They opened a hospital for those people. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And experienced that tradition in, 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 um, in action. Um, I sometimes do things to my group that I take for granted uh, and don't put their common welfare first. The, I don't put the unity of that group first. Um... So here I am confronted with three basic questions. One we find that we use from the doctor's opinion at the top of page 23, and it has to do with what happens after I start to drink. This physical craving, this physical aspect of alcoholism. The basic question would be, why do you drink so much every time you start drinking? Or do you lose control over the amount once you start? And I find a way to use that material the best way I can. And I, and I try to search that material because you won't find much about the craving past page 23. And I try to search that material for the right questions. And I try to answer those questions experientially rather than just here. And then we find that from 23 to 43, we look at the mind of the alcoholic, this thing that happens before the first drink. I remember when a man took me through an exercise when I thought I knew what alcoholic insanity meant. This word that we throw around a lot, alcoholic insanity. And he says, he says, Joe, make a list of the ten craziest things you ever did. So I guess if you were new today or anybody that would like to, just real quickly, whatever comes to mind, think of the ten most insane things that you as an alcoholic ever did. So I make this list, armed robbery, boom, 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 all the way down. And every one of them's drunk. And he shakes his head and he said, Son, I'll bet you $10,000 right now that I can show you that the most insane thing you ever did, not number five, not number eight, number one, the most insane thing you ever did was with nothing in your system, bone dry, further away from your last drink than you'd ever been, at your very best. And you know what he did for me that night? He brought me out from behind the bottle. You know that old excuse we love to use? That you're pissed off you can't use anymore after you've been around for a while to apologize to someone? Oh, honey, I was drunk. Right. Now you have to say, 
Well, I'm 10 years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and let me tell you about the petty little lies that I told you. I'd rather make amends for armed robbery than the petty little things I do sober. Because he brought me out from behind my oldest excuse, and I saw the most insane thing that I've ever done was to pick up the first drink. 28 days out of the Michigan State Penitentiary, further away from my last drink than I'd ever been, I commit the most insane act. And that that's alcoholic insanity. I was at a meeting one time in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming, in a detox center. And um, the leader of the meeting had seven and a half years, and everybody else were patients. And there was me, the guy that brought me, and an American Indian man. And the leader of the meeting was seven and a half years, wanted to talk about he wants to drink. And after about 30 minutes of that, I think everyone in the room wanted to drink, right? And I wanted to drink. And, and they called on me, and I said something, and they called on the other guy, he said something. And they said, uh, before we close the meeting, would the uh, friend from the reservation like to share? And he, he's got one of these voices, really calm and peaceful, and in about two words, he had the attention of the whole room. And he says, he's shaking his head, and he says, you know, because everybody was talking about the crazy stuff they would do if they got drunk. He said, you know, I've heard a lot today about the crazy stuff you think you'd do if you got drunk and alcoholic insanity. He said, but I heard one time about a man who walked into a bar and ordered a shot of whiskey and a glass of beer. And he left the shot of whiskey, but he drank the beer. And then he ordered another shot and another beer, and he drank them both. And he did this all night long. And at the end of the night, the bartender says, I'm really wondering why you left that shot of whiskey. He said, well, some people in Alcoholics Anonymous told me if I didn't take the first drink, I wouldn't get drunk. And he says, and I think there's more to the insanity of alcoholism than that. Thank you very much. And the whole room was just floored. So when confronted with those three basic questions, why do you drink so much once you start? Why do you always drink again every time you've stopped? And can you on your own manage your life? My ego wants to keep the problem out here. Why do I drink so much when I start? Well, I go through the, the thing. Her, them, this, because I felt bad, and they break it down for me. Didn't you do it when she stayed? Didn't you do it when you felt good? Didn't you do it when... And I see that my admission, this admission, I thought to admit meant to give something up. I, I think the definition of admission that works for me is to let in. Right? It said on our program that you need a badge to be admitted to the conference. Or you go to a movie and it says, admit one. I believe this admission is about letting truth in. And I come to this admission about what happens to me once I start to drink. And I come to this admission that regardless of circumstance or my emotional nature, feeling good, bad, at the top in the penthouse, that's on Skid Row, doesn't matter where I am, regardless of circumstance or my emotional state, I can't seem to stay stopped. And then you get to page 44, And they say that in all this work you've done up to that point, they hope they've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. And if they haven't, they repeat the same two things again that they hope you're convinced of before you get to page 44, that all those pages were to find out only about these two things. If when you honestly want to, you can't stay stopped entirely. And when drinking, you have little control over the amount, you're probably alcoholic. And I found out they spent all this time in different ways for different people to relate to, finding the right questions. Sometimes they use stories. Sometimes they make point-blank statements. Sometimes they say it in a real sneaky way. Sometimes they say it flat out. All those pages, we're talking from the doctor's opinion to the, to the top of 44, that's about 54 out of 164 which leads me to believe that those two admissions about what happens when I start to drink and what happens every time I stop drinking are pretty important to convince me, to help me see, to help me concede to my innermost self that I can't keep myself stopped and I can't control it once I start. So I have a body that craves more that shouldn't have alcohol in it and a mind that consigns me to put it in my system again. I am powerless over alcohol. And we took that part of the first step in two parts, body and mind. Now, I've been told by people that have been doing this a lot longer than me that in that, fra- in that statement, if when you honestly want to, you can't stop entirely, or 
if when drinking you have little control over the amount. That, and also in other places in this book, there's what they call drunk traps, where if you're working with somebody who's looking for a way out or they want to fight you, they'll always go to the one word. So I guess the question would be, what do you think the one word in that statement would be if somebody wasn't convinced about both, they weren't sure about one or the other, that they would go to to fight you with? They will always go to the word or. And they'll say, see, it doesn't say you have to have both. It says you only have to have one or the other. Well, the great news for those people is that if you can control, if you can keep yourself stopped, just make up your mind never to drink again, but don't go on with this. Or if you, if you get the obsession, but you don't get the craving, next time you get the obsession, just drink the way you want. It isn't or, it's both. Because if I didn't have the obsession, I would never drink again. And I would make up my mind to do that, and I would be able to do that. Or, if I get the obsession, but I don't get the craving, next time I get the obsession, just drink the way you want with, with, with control. So, or is a great drunk trap. But then they make a statement that if turned into a question, I've seen people have to consider more than looking at the craving or the obsession, and that is, do you believe you're suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer? Do I really believe that? And I've worked with men and women who have had no trouble seeing the craving. They have experience after experience after experience where they would lose control over the amount once they would start. They have no trouble seeing the obsession because every single time they ever stopped, they drank again. Really have to make some considerations. Do I really think this is something, not only an illness, but do I think it's an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer? Maybe there's the right woman, the right job the right amount of money, the right amount of knowledge, the right amount of therapy, the right sponsor, the right group. Maybe there's something other for me to keep me sober other than a spiritual experience. And that's a valid consideration at that point. Then they present where once you've admitted that, that I really suffer from something that only a spiritual experience will conquer. Then they say, faced with that, there's really only two alternatives, nothing in the middle. You're either going to go on the best you can, die in an alcoholic death, or live on a spiritual basis. And they say these two alternatives are not easy to face. And one time through this work, I asked myself, why aren't these two alternatives easy to face? And what I realized was, is because they're the only two, and I can't pull off either one. I failed at dying an alcoholic death. I couldn't even do that. I just kept living, feeling the way I was feeling. And living on a spiritual basis... There's the next pertinent question. Can you self-will your own spiritual progress? And if I could, wouldn't I be doing a lot better at 10 years than I am? So those two alternatives at this point, at 10 years, were not easy to face because they're my only two. I can choose one, but that doesn't mean I can make it happen the way I would like it to. And then if that isn't enough, they assume you've chosen that to live on a spiritual basis. You see how each link of the chain begins to fit? And they're all kind of wrapped up here as far as powerlessness on page 44. If I can't control the amount once I start, and I can't seem to keep myself stopped, and I can't, and I really do suffer from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer, and there's really only two alternatives for me, and I've chosen one of those, then they go on to say, if all you needed was a code of morals or a better philosophy of life, Many of us would have recovered long ago. And I have actually heard people in AA refer to AA as a set of principles that I can incorporate in my life. My God, we weren't raised by animals. Are there really any principles in this program we weren't told as kids that we would have loved to live up to? I've also heard people say AA is a set of steps that I can incorporate in my life. It says here, and if we can agree on one thing, that those things, the steps and the, and, the, and the principles, are codes of morals and better philosophies for living. It says right here that if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, you and I would have recovered long ago, that we couldn't will these things with all our might. The needed power isn't there. And then it tells me the main purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show me how to find a power greater than myself which will solve my problem. The main purpose, right there on page 45, it gives me the main purpose of this program. It gives me the main purpose for my life. It gives me the main purpose of this whole deal. <clears throat> Only if one thing's true, though. Only if lack of power is really my problem. 
If I have the power to control booze once I start to drink it, and I have, or I have the power to keep myself sober, or I have the power to manage my life, then lack of power is not my dilemma. My friend always used to say, you know when lack of power is a dilemma for an alcoholic? When you want to do something. I need to find a power by which I can live. It doesn't say quit drinking. It says I need to find a power by which I can live, obviously. And it has to be a power greater than myself. But where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this whole deal is about. Its main object is to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problem. I love what Joe and Charlie say about that statement. You know, they say, it doesn't say, its main object is to enable me to find a power greater than myself so I can solve my problems. It says, the main object is to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which will solve my problems. There's a big difference. I love when you see somebody think they submitted themselves to the first five steps and then they get to six and seven and they make a list of their defects and then they decide their sponsor tells them what order to work on them and they think they're working on their defects. They have been enabled to find a power greater than themselves so they can solve their problems and they become judge, jury and ex executioner. Right. You see people in a long time in six and seven, they are not working six and seven if they're alcoholic. I think that'll be the day anybody like me removes their defects or, or shortcomings. I think those are the steps where maybe God's supposed to do something. And you want to know when you've, what those people are doing when they're a long time in six and seven? They're doing everything they can to keep from doing eight and nine. Right? And if you want to know the exact moment, the exact moment when you've done six and seven, I can tell you the exact moment you'll know when you've done six and seven. When you have a piece of paper and a pencil and you're making a list of those you've harmed and becoming willing to make amends to them all. I believe in my heart of hearts that there is an experience at each step, but I believe the real miracle of each step is in the action of the next. And when someone like me, with all this knowledge, can say a simple prayer and be taken past what he thinks he knows and come to a full concession, although it's been at different levels each time to fully concede to my innermost self at 10 years that I'm an alcoholic and what that really means to me now at, with this many years was a little different than the first time I did this work. So you come to it where you are. It meets you. It meets you where you are. This should be as relevant to you as it is to me. Any of these propositions, no matter how long you're sober. You come to this concession about the truth between you and booze. And some of you if it's happened today, even a little bit, even just confronted with these propositions, some of you have maybe experienced a little bit of tension. If the experience begins to happen, you will begin to experience a tension. It is that tension you follow through to the second step and through the work that turns into pure power. It is that tension that's meant to be created from these propositions, if they're true for you. If they're not true for you, they should produce some freedom. Now, there's been times when they've produced both. But the, the reason to move on, I do not go to the second step out of virtue. Because it's a wonderful, lovely thing. My friend always says, you can't go to the second step in a good mood. Right? I remember the first time Paul, doc, went, uh, the first time Paul and I met. And I asked him a specific question, which I had seen people turn into from what he wrote there in that page, 449. And I asked him, people tell me I need to accept the first step. That I am powerless over alcohol and that my life is unmanageable. He says, if that's so acceptable, why would you go to God? He says he was glad he came to things within himself on a regular basis that were unacceptable. I do not accept this. This is why I'm here. I can admit it. I can concede to it. That doesn't mean it's okay. I move into the second step because this condition of powerlessness and unmanageability has become, once again, absolutely unacceptable to me. That's why I go to God. And if you think that's not enough, then they take you to the middle of page 52 and they take you through each area of your life to see the unmanageability, to see the spiritual malady. To see untreated alcoholism. And I think those three terms are the same. 
I think that untreated alcoholism is the unmanageability, and I think unmanageability is the spiritual malady, and I don't think those things are because of anything outside of me. We were talking at the break, and I remembered a woman that I heard one time, and she said that on my first birthday, I said that I was an alcoholic because of my husband, my kids, my car, my job, my boss. And a man came up to me and said, maybe you'd want to consider this. She went through the steps. And on her second birthday, she had the same job, the same kids, the same car, the same house, the same boss, the same job. And they weren't why she was alcoholic. She was alcoholic because of this stuff that we've covered. On her fifth birthday, she was saying, my life is unmanageable because of my kids, my car, my job, my boss, my husband. And the same man came up to her and said, is it possible you're selling this power short and you're in denial? And she went through the steps again, and her husband didn't change, her kids didn't change, her car didn't change, her job didn't change, her boss didn't change, and her life wasn't unmanageable anymore. And what she found out about that was that it is nothing out here that makes my life unmanageable. It is my reaction to it. And they take me through this paragraph. And I have found several ways of looking at this paragraph to get in touch with this tension about the unmanageability. But what it basically does is it takes you through each area of your life. And they should be as relevant to you, no matter how many years sober, as they were to me this tenth time. How are you really doing with personal relationships? Now, when you're new, it just has to do with on your own power. Can you make personal relationships happen the way you'd like them to? Can you control your emotional nature? Can you make misery and depression disappear? Can you make a living that's satisfactory to you by itself? Can you make uselessness disappear? Can you make fear go away? Can you make yourself be of real help to other people? I go through that on my own power. How well do I do with those things on my own power? Then, to bring it back to booze, look at the idea when looking at page 52. If each of these areas was exactly the way you wanted them to be, would that be enough to keep you sober? And I go back to my life when they were the way I wanted them to be, and I still drank. That brings me back where the unmanageability is directly connected to booze. Because my mind starts to convince me, and there's one statement back a few pages that we didn't cover, that sums up every problem I've ever had sober. And that's a pretty strong statement to make. There is a statement in More About Alcoholism that we here in, in Southern California read at every meeting that sums up every single problem I've ever had since I've been sober, and that is the delusion that I am like other people presently. Because I start to think my trouble with dishonesty, my trouble with relationships, my trouble with my emotions, my trouble with my selfishness, my trouble with my fear has nothing to do with me fighting booze because I'm now like other people. But if I'm an alcoholic, whenever I'm fighting any of those things, I'm fighting alcohol because I'm an alcoholic. And behind my dishonesty is a drink. Behind my fear is a drink. Behind what I do in relationships is a drink behind my selfishness, etc., etc. So we bring that unmanageability right back to what it's really about. Then the one that gets me every time, for those of you that have been around, you can't say this to a brand new guy because he hasn't had experience with this power. He hasn't had experience with this grace. But the one that kills me, as it did this year, is how well are you really doing with each of these areas with the power and the grace of God that you've been given up to this point, what do I do? And I begin to experience this tension that's created from truth and the admission of it. And I move into this need for power to be taken beyond where I am. And I'm confronted with the first, second step consideration. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than myself. If you're new, that's enough. I mean, it's a, sometimes for, for when I was new, it was just a big step forward to have some kind of willingness. Now, if you've been around for a while and somebody was to ask you, now, after all these years, how much do you believe? And you could measure it and you say, well, this much. Or if one of the, which are the hardest people to work with when they're new, if you get a believer. I love this analogy. And this man that I know that's worked with more alcoholics than anybody I know tells it. And it has to do with three types of people, of all the people he's ever worked with that approach the first step. He says, first of all, there's the bigot. 
And the bigot comes to this, whatever the question might be, with knowledge, and he knows. He either knows that he is or he knows that he isn't. doesn't matter. Same scale, different end. He knows. And what the bigot is filled with is contempt prior to investigation. Contempt without any consideration. He knows. He said, then there's the man that's the hardest to work with, and that's the pious man. The pious man doesn't know. The pious man, he believes. And he usually uses God to justify it. He's the nodder and the shaker. He's the one in the bar between a Democrat and a Republican in major trouble. Right? He's the one you can tell by the last person he talked to. Right? Now, there's a little bit of the bigot and the pious man in all of us. He said, then there's the man of consideration willing to look at both sides. Maybe I am. But you know what? Maybe I'm not. And he says, that place comes from a place when you're put in the middle, willing to look at both sides. You can't see it from either end. And it is only in the middle that you can receive grace to move beyond where you are. doesn't mean you can't continue to receive grace on either end. You can receive grace to stay where you are. But to move past where I am, I must be placed in a position in the middle, willing to look at both sides of every question. So, when confronted with the question, do I really believe, and I say, this much, even in the height of my ego, after ten years, I can't really take the credit for some of this, so I believe this much. And what I find that chapter does is another paradox. Just like the paradox to the first step, in the admission of no power, you receive power. And in the other paradox, maybe if you look at your not, that maybe you're not, you might find out you really are. Now, in the second step, I think to come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity, I need to go home and see how much I believe. And what the chapter actually does is helps you see where you don't believe so you can come to believe. And what you think is this much is slowly torn down piece by... Well, isn't this much of it about your mind? And the one I love that, that I'm big on is worshiping the God of reason. Didn't we ourselves worship the God of reason? That's when I think that what I think is the be and all and the end all. The zero, I mean the alpha and the omega. Nothing goes any further than I can think. There's nothing beyond what I know. There's no way I can ta be taken beyond what I think I know until I begin to experience that prayer about putting aside what I think I know and I find myself wondering about things that I thought I was sure about. That's what that prayer does. So here I am thinking that I believe this much if it was measurable. And they say, well, isn't this much of it about people and sentiment and things and money and yourself? And you're ten years sober and you, and you make this consideration. Do I really believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself that can really move me beyond where I am with each area of my life on page 52 and then go to each of those areas and face my agnosticism this long sober? So what I found from that is that for those of us that have been around for a while, came to believe doesn't always mean more. It sometimes means less than what I think it is. And sometimes what I think I come to this with this much after all these years is really only about this much and it's really only just willingness when confronted with the right questions. And they say, boy, that's a great place to start with a guy who thought he knew so much, who thought so much had happened that you're really open to thinking that you could be taken beyond where you are with relationships to levels of peace and freedom and existence that you can't even imagine with your emotional nature, with freedom from alcohol, with making a living with money, finance, health. You're really willing to face that you're willing to believe this power might take you further than where you are, that God isn't finite, that He isn't measurable in any area, that this isn't it, when your ego is trying to tell you this is it, this is all there's going to be with this area or this area. Because if, if it isn't, then God isn't everything. He's finite. He's measurable. This is it. But if I'm willing to believe that God can take me beyond where I am, regardless of where I am, that statement should meet me where I am. If I'm willing to believe I can be taken beyond where I am, then I get to make a choice. My first, second step went like this. God is either everything or I'm screwed. God either is or I isn't. Now, to me, ten years later, to make this second step choice, this second major proposition in that chapter, 
how does a guy like me get taken to a place by just admitting or being shown some truth in the first step and just with a little bit of willingness that he couldn't even muster up on his own, how does he get taken to a place where he gets to choose about God? God is either everything or He's nothing. God either is or He isn't. What is our choice to be? Now, the funny thing about that is that each time I come to this proposition, it's new. It's a new proposition. It's a new, let's say, container that I get to go to the well with. So there's a proposition there. I've gone to the well 10,000 times. After all these years, how many times have I gone to the well and gotten more than I ever dreamed of? Maybe that's it. Maybe I've had mine. Maybe this is it. Maybe I've arrived. Maybe there is no more. Or maybe there's levels of peace and freedom and existence and making a living and finance and personal relationships and emotional nature that I can't even imagine. And what I find out is each time I've come to this, God is either everything or nothing. I'm the one that's gone with the container of my own size. First time I went with a thimble. And I got more than that thimble could hold, but by the time it overflowed and I realized it, all that was left was just about what it could hold. The second time, the stakes were a little higher. I had a little more stuff. I was a little more scared. I was a little more awake. And I went with a coffee cup. And that coffee cup was overflowed. And by the time I realized it was overflowed, it only had about as much left as it could hold. Next time I came with a quart jar, faced with this proposition and moving through the rest of this work, and it overflowed. But it's always been my container and it's always been my conception of everything. Thank God they say if any of us could fully define or comprehend that power which is God, it's impossible. What about coming to the well with, an, with, a, with a container that's, that has no limits? What about really going for it? This American Indian guy this year asked me, was I willing to sacrifice? Was I willing to give up? Was I willing to let go of everything I've done and everything I've experienced in the last ten years? And that was a hell of a proposition, especially with the good stuff. Real easy to give up the... What, what did Bill say in the 12 by 12 that I love? My human best or where I've been brought after all these years can actually at this stage turn into the enemy of the very best that God has for me, that the good can hold me back because that's my... I've set the standard. And I come to this proposition. And then a, f a few pages later, they answer the very question that they posed on page 45. Where and how are we to find this power? And that seems like a good question to, to ask when someone is confronted with lack of power, whether it's physically, mentally, or spiritually. Whether we're talking the craving, the obsession, or the unmanageability. Faced with those three parts of my disease and this need for power, and my willingness to believe that this power can really do something, and having made that second step choice, it seems like a good time to find out, well then where and how am I going to find this power? But if you don't need any power, you're not going to be open to finding out where it is. But if you are, and they probably assume if you've gotten to page 55 that you're convinced of everything up to it, they tell you exactly how and exactly where to find that power. And they say that how to do that is to search fearlessly. And where to find that is deep down within. And that it is only there that God can be found. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't come to me through people. But thank God some of the people God was coming through, they said to find it myself within. Because that's where it was coming from. Because at 3 o'clock in the morning when there ain't nobody that God's coming through around, and there ain't no phone, the phone's out of order, and there ain't no God coming through the phone, and you ain't got a meeting to run to, the idea that there is a place within ourselves where we can experience God regardless of circumstance or emotional state is an amazing experience. If you were to ask me today with all honesty, what would you rather give up than anything in the world? There is nothing in my life that I wouldn't give up to keep and maintain a quiet place within myself where I can go. Because if you have that, if you're broke, you can be at peace. You don't always have to change the outsides to be at peace. There is a place within myself when my head is going a million miles an hour where there's peace. There is a place within myself when things are a little crazy as far as circumstances in my life where there is peace. And they talked about finding the great reality deep down within. 
So, when confronted with the question, why do you think God's working in your life? My ego wanted to do the same thing that it did with, why do you think you're an alcoholic? And at seven and a half years, when confronted with the question, why do you think God's working in your life? I automatically went to, I turned into the guy that's at the meeting and says, I know God's working in my life because there was a parking place just for me outside of the meeting. Right? Or to be so self-centered to think that out of everyone on the highway that day, God made it rain just for me to slow down. Right? Or look at how great things are in my life. I went to circumstance again. And someone said to me, do you think there's a place where God can be when circumstances are a little bit crazy and things aren't going the way you want? What are you worshiping? Things going your way? Or God? And I saw that I was worshiping circumstance. And I was basing the reality of God being in my life on how things were going. But what about when things aren't going really great? And we all have that. So then my ego shifted up on me and said, I know God's working in my life because I feel good most of the time. And my friend says to me, what are you worshiping, God or your emotions? What about a place where God can be when you're not feeling really great, when you really need Him there? And I started to get free of circumstance and emotional state having anything to do with this admission and this experience of why I say to you, God's working in my life. It is something that when you experience, you just know. It's like the difference between what you thought it would be like to have an orgasm the day before you had one and what it was like that when you knew the next day what it was like to have one. You know on a level that isn't... I mean, I've been listening to this man the last couple for the last year named Joseph Campbell uh, from a series of uh, videos. And he says... And he's not talking about Alkies. He's talking about people on a spiritual path. And he says, you know, those of us on this path we really only get to talk about the third most important stuff. And that caught... I was reading a magazine or something. That kind of caught my attention. I look... Because I like to think that, that we, or that, that, that I, get to talk about the first most important stuff, don't we? He says, no. We on this path really only get to talk about the, first, the third most important stuff. He says, the first most important stuff you can't put into words. How do you describe your experience of, of, of looking at a flower? or a sunset, or the sea, or the presence of God. The second most important stuff are only our words that we're using to describe the first most important stuff, and you always lose somebody in the translation. So we get to talk about the third most important stuff. And I understood that. Because I would like to think the first most important stuff takes, takes place up here. Or some of us like to think the first most important stuff is how we feel. And as long as you're focused on how you think or how you feel, you're stuck in two dimensions that don't work for me. Can I live from a fourth dimension that Bill described? Is there a place other than, than mind, body, and emotion? Is there a fourth dimension? Well, there's a, there's a fourth part of my disease. I'm not only physically, mentally, and emotionally sick, I am spiritually sick. So there must be a place where there's spirit, where I can live from, where what goes on with my body where what goes on with my emotions, where what goes on with my mind, with what I can do with 10 and 11, with where inventory comes from, with my ability to do this, where I can sit when somebody asks me a stupid question sit in my living room that I'm working with, where can I go to get those answers or that peace or the ability to do this or the ability to change? It all comes from spirit. Not from my head. Not from how I feel. Not from the physical, the physical realm that we live in. The idea that there, and there, this chapter happens to say, that there can really be a God personal to me is where some alcoholic's mind will absolutely snap shut. Blocked by obstinacy, prejudice, sensitiveness, pomp, circumstance. Can't be for me. He might say that's true for him, but I doubt it. But I don't think there's any place like that for me. And they beg me to get past that prejudice. So that set-aside prayer was as valuable in the second step as it was in the first step. I remember going to Don one time and saying something about... It was either something really good or something really bad. When you're new, it doesn't really matter. But when I, I went to him and I said, you know, I don't feel like I deserve this. He said, thank God if everyone in these rooms got what they deserved, we'd be sitting in the empty rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, I don't think this is about justice. I think this is about mercy. 
And I choose a conception that works for me. We've seen it work through other people. We've come to believe in the futility of life as we've been living it. And I make this choice. Everything or nothing. Choose God or not. The scary thing about that is I think there's only two things and I think there's only two directions to head. And I think there's only two forces. And if you're an alcoholic, they're probably the only two forces and they're probably the only two directions you can be headed in at any time. And I think those two directions and those two forces are either booze or God. And I think at any given moment I'm headed toward one or the other. And I think taken to a place in the middle of the second step, I get to choose which direction I want to head and can be given the power at the next preceding steps to move toward whichever one I've chosen. You can do that consciously. You can do that unconsciously. You can choose out of this and slowly head toward your next drink without even knowing it and begin to make decisions that might set you up for your next drink way down the road. I think it's silly sometimes when we hear people say the reason so-and-so drank is because he quit going to meetings. That means that meetings keep us sober. I think it would know, and I've checked it out myself. I have gone to people who stopped going to meetings before they drank, and every single one of them stopped doing and decided a few things way before they stopped going to meetings. I met a guy who at 23 years drank, and he said he, he began his journey to his next drink at 17 years, and it took till he was 23. And I think at this place I get to choose. What do I want? What do I need? And what do I want to head for? And then I get to decide. And that's what the next step is all about. I remember when I thought, and I was sitting in North Denver, Colorado, before I started this work, so it was in my first five months. I remember saying something like, um, the old AA shuffle. I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but when I was doing the AA shuffle, it went like, um, I turned it over and I took it back. And I turned it over and I took it back. And this old, this old guy looks at me and he said, Son, why don't you shut up and sit down? <laughs> that didn't necessarily feel good. I thought your job was to do whatever was necessary to make me feel good, especially my sponsor. And you go to him and you say things like, I feel unworthy and, 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 and insecure. And his eyes light up and he says, you want to know why? I said, yeah, I've been looking for the answer to that for 12 years. He said, you want to know why you feel unworthy and insecure? I said, yeah. He said, because you're unworthy and insecure. <laughs> and I think that's so simple. And it's not heavy and it's not Freudian and there's no one to blame. And I'm sitting there in North Denver doing the AH. I turned it over. I took it back. This old guy says, why? and I drank enough alcohol to shut up and sit down. I'd like to think sometimes that God got me to AA. And I, I don't care to debate whether He kept me alive or not. I believe He did. But I wasn't just a, well, uh, a healthy, well-adjusted human being walking down the street one day thinking that it would be a nice thing to go to AA. I think alcohol had a little something to do with me getting to AA. Right? There are some places in AA nowadays where they don't want to talk about the two most important things. They, want, they don't want to talk about booze and they don't want to talk about God. My God, what else is there for us when you really come down to it? Whether we're talking unity, recovery, or service, it's either one or the other for me. So here I am doing the AA shuffle. And this old guy says, if you're still doing that, you haven't turned it over. And I learned to ask the second greatest question I've ever learned to ask in AA. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and if you're new, I'll really screw it up for some of the old timers around here. If you're new and you hear some of these uh, slogans thrown around, or somebody says something, if, you, if, you, if you're still doing that, you haven't turned it over. Ask them what they mean. You'll find out something real interesting in AA. I'm not going to tell you what you'll find out, but you'll find out something real interesting. So I said, what do you mean? If I'm still doing that, I haven't turned it over. He says, there's a, di there's a difference between a decision and a commitment. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if you told someone to go sit in the corner and pray for ham and eggs and they decided to do that and they went in the corner and prayed for ham and eggs and then just, just sat there, they'd probably starve to death. But if you told someone to go sit in the corner and pray for ham and eggs and they decided to do that and they did that and they got up and made one hell of a commitment and you showed them how to put one foot in front of the other, they'd probably eat ham and eggs. 
And I said, what do you mean? He said, there's a difference between the decision at the third step and the commitment that follows. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's like a chicken and a pig walking down the road. And they come to a big sign on a church that says, help feed the poor. And the, pig, uh, the chicken's all pumped up with virtue because he likes to do nice things for people. And he says to the pig, gee, we ought to do something about that hunger problem. The pig says, well, what in the world could we do about that hunger problem? The chicken says, we could feed those poor people ham and eggs. The pig had a little more sense than I did when I took the third step because he said to the chicken, for you, that's just a simple decision to lay some eggs. But for me, that's one hell of a commitment. Because we're talking about my life. But until I became convinced of three pertinent ideas and my need for power, until I became convinced that I really am an alcoholic and what that means to admit that, physically, mentally, spiritually, I'm an alcoholic. And I cannot manage my own life. And that takes place in here too. And probably, there's a drunk trap. See? It says probably. I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to find a human power that can relieve what I suffer from. There's a drunk trap. Or, maybe I'm convinced that probably no human power can relieve what I suffer from. And I'm willing to believe that God can and will. That was a big one for me. I knew that He could by seeing what happened in your lives. Will He for me as I am? That I had to spend a little time with because I'm the guy that thinks you've got to clean up to go to God. Can He really take me as I am with mud on my face? With all this that I've seen so far? Let alone what I'm going to see before I get to 6 and 7? That God can and will if He is sought. And have I decided to seek God? Maybe this is a good time to decide out. Maybe this isn't what I want to do. Maybe I have the sufficient power to manage my life or keep myself sober or both. Maybe I'm not willing. But, if I am willing to believe that God can and will if He is sought and that no human power can relieve my alcoholism and that I really am an alcoholic who can't manage his own life and I suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer because I can't keep myself stopped when I stop and I can't keep myself under control once I start and I truly believe I suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Not only every link in the chain fits forward, but every link in the chain fits backwards for why I am doing this. Then I'm at step three. Once I'm convinced, and it says being convinced. Then I was really pissed off because there was a requirement in our book to take the third step. And I'd been to a lot of meetings on the third step in a town where there are lots of people doing this work and no one ever said or I never heard that our big book says there is a requirement to take the third step. And that is, the first requirement is that I be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And I wasn't convinced of that and they give me a page and a half that helps me become convinced of that. And to this day, I don't like this page when I'm in self-will because when I'm in self-will, these two pages absolutely describe me to a T. Probably more than it. Besides maybe page 52 and the stuff about drinking, I don't think there's any two pages in this book that describe me when I'm off, when I'm into self-will, than the description of the actor who wants to be the director. I mean, I'm not only so self-centered, I want to be the actor, the focus of everything. I want to be the director also. I want to arrange the lights, the ballet, and the scenery, the rest of the players in my, only, in my own way. If only you would stay put. <coughs> I, have an, I have an ego that believes if you do as I wished, not only would I be happy, but you'd be happy too. <laughs> then they throw three little, three little things in those pages that they haven't brought up yet. Because I guess they're really only apropos when we're looking at me running my life on self-will. Because you see, if an alcoholic can be successful at running his life on his will, why would I want to decide about turning my life run on my will over to anything? So this is to convince me about where my life run on my will gets, gets me. 
It talks about even when my motives are good. Nothing better, nothing harder to see in every inventory I've ever written than stuff I do with good motives to just run over people. Oh, I only, I only wanted you to be sober. Well, I didn't want to be sober, right? You interfered with my drinking, right? Oh, nothing, nothing worse than an alcoholic with pure motives running it on self-will. Even when my motives are good, even when trying to be kind, even in my best moments, I'm a producer of confusion rather than harmony when I'm running my life on self-will. So do I meet that requirement? Am I convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success? Then there's one that I'd like to come back to when we get to the fourth column of the resentment inventory. That's the, I think up to this point, not that there aren't some further on, I think up to this point, the greatest statement of hope in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous is on page 62, and you can either do one of two things with it. You can either with your ego, which is a mask, and it'll convince you that you're a rotten, terrible, lousy person, and you'll beat yourself up with this statement, which is just ego. I always thought ego was me thinking and telling you what a great, wonderful person I am. I also found out the ego can do that in another way by making me the worst, sickest, no good in the room to separate. Either one separates me from you. What about just being one of the guys or a man among men or a man among women or a man among alcoholics? Just one of the guys. It's either better or worse. I want to be somewhere here. The only place my ego doesn't want me is the only place God is. And that's here now in the moment. It wants me yesterday, tomorrow, five hours from now, five months from now, five weeks from now, ten years ago, the stuff I did in the past. No wonder we need to make amends. To be here, the only place our ego doesn't want us, which is the only place God is. Here and now. Right here. In the moment. And I think the greatest statement of hope up to this point, on page 62 is that our troubles are of our own making. Thank God. I come to this statement like the guy who's been sober forever and he's on his deathbed. God forbid. And he looks up at his wife and he says, Honey, after all these years I've realized something. She says, What's that? And he says, Well, you know you were right there that time I got shot and you stood by me. And you were right there that time I lost all our money in business. And you stood by me. And you were right there that time I had a stroke. You were right there. And you stood by me. And you've always been right there. And you've always stood by me. And after all these years, I've realized one thing. And she says, what's that? He says, you're a jinx. And I heard that and I thought, you know, that's how I think. It's always her or them or it or that. Remember them? You never really knew quite who they were, but they were always there, right? Them. They're after me, right? The greatest statement of freedom is that my troubles are of my own making. Thank God, because they're of your, if they are of your making, I'm screwed because you're either going to have to change, get well, or see the light for me to get free. See, the light in my terms means my way. Okay. <clears throat> then, I didn't know that the third step was just a decision. I have actually heard people, and I have actually believed myself at times, when I was new, that taking the third step was turning your will and your life over to the care of God. I've taken the third step. Next day I'm at a meeting. I've turned my will and my life over to the care of God. Well, why would they have... Nine more steps. It is but a decision to turn my life, run on my will, over to the care of God. Biggest mystery of all in AA nowadays. And I didn't know before this, before this experience that the third step was just a decision. Then I thought, okay, it's just a decision. They told me the chicken pig thing. I got it. It's only a decision. Then doing the prayer is making the decision. They said, no. The decision comes before the prayer. The decision on the bottom of 62 where it says, we decided, 
This is the how and the why of it. This is how we're going to do it. And this is why. First of all, why do we need to do this? Why do I need to make this decision? Why? Because playing God doesn't work. How do I make this decision? I simply decide that from hereafter in this life, I would like God to be my director, my principal, and my father. I would like to be the actor who wants to quit running the whole show, an agent, and a child. So going back to the chapter of the agnostic, where it says, don't let any prejudice you might have against other spiritual terms that you'll read further on in this book keep you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. I consider. Now, I had some considerations to make and some old ideas to get rid of when it came to choosing God as a father. Get past that. What would I like it to be? Another place of grace. I get to choose what I would like God to be in the rest of my life. And what I would like to be. So I consider those six terms. Three about God. Three about me. Director, principal, father. Actor, agent, child. I consider them separately. Then I consider them in relationship to each other. What would it really mean for God to be my director? Do I really think there's something that could direct me and guide me and give me... Move over here. Watch what a director does. Stand over here, say this, do that, do this. Do I really believe that that's what I want? Not only do I believe, can he do that? Do I be- Is that what I want? What about uh, principal and me being an agent? Now, that changed something totally for me because I thought God was to serve me. They're talking about me being an agent of God. I mean, there's so much for the self-esteem problem, Right? I mean, if it really could go from here to here that I'm a child, that God's my dad, what more work would you ever have to do on your self-esteem? What more could you ever do, accomplish, get, have, find, make? What could you ever do to top the realization that I am a child of God to work on your self-esteem? An agent of God. It's amazing. And to make that decision that this is what I would like hereafter in this drama of life. There's promises that come in our book before the prayer is even done. I think the sneakiest thing that these guys that put this book together did was that after the prayer, they put, we thought well before taking this step. They didn't want us to think too much and they probably wanted us to do it before we thought about it. But after the prayer... They said, we thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to God. And I'm scared. To abandon utterly to God. And I asked a question of the man that I was working with. What do you think it means to abandon yourself utterly to God that I should think well about before doing this step? He said that he thought the most utter abandonment that any alcoholic anywhere could ever make would be to complete the ninth step. Part of my commitment at this decision, not that I think I had the power to get from four to nine, but part of my decision is to finish the ninth step. And I want to talk about that this afternoon. Finishing amends. And our book showing us a way, even those that can't be found, the amends can be made. But I was told that the most utter abandonment that any alcoholic could ever make and the most utter resistance you'll ever feel, the most utter fight you'll ever have with your ego, to smash the ego would be to submit myself to steps four through nine. And I made this decision. I made the third step decision. I do not... I use the third step prayer every day. I do not take the first three steps every morning. Left to myself, I'm liable to make the wrong decision on any given day. I make these considerations with an alcoholic that I trust. I do the third step every morning and every night as far as the prayer. But I don't see the prayer as the step. I see this decision as the third step decision and the prayer an affirmation that I've made it. Because once this decision is made, they tell me some things that should begin to happen when we sincerely take such a position. All sorts of remarkable things follow. I'm going to feel like I have a new employer. He's going to provide what I need if I keep close to him and perform his work well. Established on this footing, I will become less and less interested in myself my little plans and designs. More and more, I'll be interested in seeing what I can contribute to life. I might even begin to experience new power flowing in. Peace of mind. 
unbelievable third step promises and they come before the prayer is even done. And that day when he asked me to get quiet and he asked me to try to find a quiet place within myself and it was really hard to do that day, but I tried to do it and I tried to sit quietly with God in a place within me with my own conception there with me. And he left me alone in a room for a few minutes and came back out. Some of those promises happened the first time I made this decision. There was some peace of mind. During those few minutes, I wasn't so interested in myself and my little plans and designs. I began to feel like something was flowing inward. He came out and we did the prayer. Great prayer. We got up off our knees and I asked the first most important question in AA. The biggest mystery in AA nowadays. You know, some of you that might be new or have heard this before, you share some terrible problem. And somebody in the back of the room goes, just turn it over. And you want to take them and you want to start to strangle them really slowly. And you want to say, if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be here. So I got up off my knees and I asked the greatest question I ever learned to ask. If that was just a decision, then how do you turn it over? He said, can you count from four to nine? I said, yeah, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He said that, right. I said, what do you mean? He said, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Acts against the will, contrary to the way we've lived our lives. That's how we turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. And what I would like to talk about this afternoon are those first steps of action. The commitment that I make after this decision. The way I've turned my will and my life over to the care of God. And there's the paradox. I think the paradox for the first step for me was that in admitting that, in admitting that I have no power, I received more than I've ever had. And by looking at maybe I'm not an alcoholic, I found out more than about that I really am. And I think the paradox of the second step was that to come to believe in a power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity, I had to look at where I don't believe to come to believe. And those aren't logical. Thank God. And that to decide to turn my will and my life over to the care of God and follow that through with a commitment in four through nine, you don't lose your life or your will. You're given a new life better than you've ever had and a will that you can begin to use properly. And that's what the tenth step is all about. I think the action of turning our wills and our lives over to the care of God, for me, from my experience, has been to submit myself to things totally against my will. And I'd like to share with you how inventory, the way it's outlined in this book, and five, and six, and seven, and eight, and nine, have been totally against my will and contrary to the way I lived my life for 30 years. Thanks for letting me share. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> Great lunch. <clears throat> it's great being here. A little bit about what we've covered so far. I tried to share as best I could with the time we had, and it still takes quite a long time on the first step. That's a lot of, a lot of stuff when you look at the, if you look at the first 11 steps which are contained between uh, the doctor's opinion and the end of into action, it's about, um, Eighty-eight plus the doctor. It's about ninety-eight pages to cover eleven steps. They spend about um, sixty-two pages out of those just on the first step that we've been able to use from this book. Um, I tried to share in a in a way of looking at the first step in three parts. My first experience with that was that. Um, 
I thought the little dash meant to fill in the blank. And what I wanted to say was, I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, and that's why my life is unmanageable. And I thought the um, second half of the first step was because of the first half, until I was around for a while sober without a drink trying to manage my life, and I saw that the second half of step one has very little to do with the first half unless you're still drinking, and that my life was unmanageable sober. And then I started to see and look at a three-part disease of both body, mind, and spirit, and saw that the book literally lays it out that way, and that we tried to look at two parts to the powerlessness, and this, this admission, this concession to my innermost self as far as what happens once I take a drink, and then what happens when I stop taking a drink, and then it, as far as the body and the mind, and then um, the second half of step one, to look at the spiritual malady, which is the unmanageability, which is untreated alcoholism, uh, which is a part of the disease that I didn't even know I had until I was further away from my last drink than I'd ever been and woke up to the fact of what I was suffering from at the core, at the root. The book calls it the root of our troubles, the, the root of alcoholism. The other two parts were just the symptoms. I need to be clear on those, and I need to know that, that that not only could, but will happen to me without this power, and find out where I am with that. Um, I, guess, I guess the first step for me, no matter what part we're talking about, whether it's looking back on my drinking, and what the truth about me and alcohol is, or whether I'm looking at the unmanageability of my life, I guess it has to do with where I am right now, where wherever one might start that. And it has to do with me and power. Um, power, power, who's got the power? Um, I'm not God. Or maybe I am. And I think if there's any one step where, where we get to examine that, even more than what we looked at at the third step, where me playing God, running my life on my will, where that gets me, would be probably the fourth step until you get to see it in in front of you through the people you've harmed in your life in the middle of the ninth step. Um, so to look at those propositions in the first part of this book, we basically used from the doctor's opinion to the top of page 23, doing as much as you can turning statements into questions to look at the craving. And then from 23 to 43 to look at the obsession. Does this really happen to me? Can I keep myself sober? Do I need this power? Uh, continuing to turn statements into questions. And then I basically try to use three pages, because I've met a lot of people that know this book and they, they might even know where to look at the craving and where to look at the obsession. And very few of them have anything to offer anyone as far as using this textbook of where to look at the unmanageability, the second part of step one. And I tried to use those three basic pages, 44, 45, and page 52, which takes me into the middle of each area of my life and I ask myself how I'm doing or how, how well do I think I could continue to do with each of these areas on my own power. And then um, to begin to experience that tension that the first step creates and then come to this idea about where am I with this power? Where do I have doubt and skepticism and prejudice and all the things you find scattered out through that chapter to the agnostic that we try to use for step two to, to face your own agnosticism and then make that second step question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself and then make that second step choice. Either um, God is either everything or he's nothing. And then examine the first requirement of the third step, being convinced of the ABCs. There is one statement in there I'd like to make a comment about that I heard at so many meetings before I did this work and I wondered what in the world do they mean? And it comes when we hear how it works in um, just before the ABCs where it says the description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. And I don't know what I thought that meant, but when I had done the work up to that place and I realized what I had done looking at the description of the alcoholic, which is step one, and what I had done looking at step two in the chapter to the agnostic, all of it was related to my own personal adventures 
before the first drink and after the first drink. So the way I heard that after I had done the work up to this point was that the description of the alcoholic, step one, the chapter to the agnostic, step two, and my own personal adventures before the first drink and after the first drink, drunk or sober, make clear three pertinent ideas, that I'm an alcoholic and I can't manage my own life, that probably no human power can relieve what I suffer from, and that I was willing to believe that God could and would if he were sought, and then looked at the first requirement of the third step, me being convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success, and then making that third step decision and, and doing the prayer. Um, which basically takes us to the fourth step. <clears throat> it's amazing to me, from my own experience, and from working with a lot of people, how with the directions right here in the book, how, how, how hard it is to find the directions until somebody showed me. I mean, they even give an example of the first three columns on page 65, and I still, from the directions on the previous page on 64, couldn't figure out how to write inventory. Um, it's also amazing to me the number of different ways that people have come up with to write inventory. 